Okay. One of the volunteers said, but what does that mean? Well, I said, that's what we're going to find out. And that's first on the agenda here. We're going to give about 15 minutes approximately to talking about Sankofa, the history of what it means, and then another 15 minute spot where I'm going to read you a story called A Little Girl from Everywhere. And then the final 15 minutes, finding the story of the people will be our theme for that, that spot. And uh, in between, you get to do some calisthenics even. So Sankofa, go back to the past and bring forward that which is useful. That is the title of this session. Part one, what does Sankofa mean? So everybody, now that you're all situated, please stand up. <laughs> All right. I know at conferences like this, you're going to be doing a lot of sitting. So we're going to break it up just a little bit in this one. Okay. We're going to do the Sankofa stretch. That's not really a part of Sankofa. I understand. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, everyone say San. San. That means return or go back. Everyone say Ko. Oh, that means go. Everyone say fa. Fa, fa. That means look, seek, or take. And go. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get to this next part, this is where we're going to do the stretch. This, this version, I want you just to go back as far as you can. And say, go back and get it. And I did. All right. Now you can sit down. Thank you. What is the importance of Sankofa? Reaching back to knowledge gained in the past and bringing it into the present in order to make positive <laughs> progress in the future. The Sankofa is a metaphorical symbol used by the Akan people of Ghana. It is the general depiction of a bird with its long neck reaching and its head turned backward, taking an egg from its back. And this is an expression of the importance of reaching back to knowledge gained in the past and bringing it forward into the present in order to make progress in the future. Spirit of Sankofa. What is the spirit of Sankofa? Sankofa is a word in the Asante Twi language, if I'm saying that right, I think I am, uh, of Ghana. That means, uh, well, go back and get it. Now, I let our friend Tony know that I was going to be here, but he's probably working. He works over at uh, the Dillons on the west side uh, in the produce department over there. And uh, he is where I got this, and I'll talk about this a little bit too. But I left off the H on his name there when I put that together. So there really should be an H on there. And I took his boiled down definition to, to give here. Go back and get it. Go back and get it. Okay, the symbol. So this uh, is symbolized by this bird with its uh, feet facing forward and its head looking back. And this is an artistic representation that I that I like that I took here to use for this of uh, this bird. The spirit of San. Kofa encompasses taking from the past what is good and bringing it into the present to make progress in the future. The story of Sankofa. The story of Sankofa is based on an African proverb 
that says it is not taboo to go back and fetch that which you have forgotten. Meaning, in other words, you can't know where you are going unless you know where you come from. A related African proverb, keep your eyes on tomorrow with your feet on today, which means plan, look ahead, be prepared, but stay grounded. We've spoken of the egg, and that's in the symbol with the bird. The bird has the egg in its, in its mouth, its beak. What about this egg? What does the egg represent? Again, the word Sankofa is from the Asante Twi language of the Akan people of Western Africa. Now, this is the part of Africa that we know as Ghana today. Uh, it's also referred to historically as the Ivory Coast, the Gulf Coast. or and the Gulf Coast. Yeah, well, and the Gold Coast is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the Ivory part, of course, refers to the Tusk of Elephants, uh, where the, that was a main port where those were taken and distributed from that point. Also, place where many people were held and then taken. Many were held here who had been captured. Uh, then they were sold as slaves to the Spanish, the English, the Dutch, and the Americans. And the great wealth of this great kingdom was built on the sale of human beings for slaves and the ivory tusks of elephants. Uh, hence that connection with that, with that word. Okay, I worked this in an extra time. I didn't even realize I did, so stand up. <laughs> and we'll just we'll just say Sankofa this time, right? Sankofa. All right. One more time. Keep your blood pumping. <laughs> And again, san means return or go back. Go is go. And the fa means to look for something, to seek it, to take it. Or like Tony says, go back and get what you need. But again, what about the egg? The egg in the bird's mouth. The most Prominent of the Asante Andintra symbols for the concept of the Sankofa depicts a mythical bird flying forward with its head turned backward and carrying an egg in its mouth. Now, the egg then represents gems of knowledge from the past upon which the wisdom of the present is based. And of course, what else does an egg? indicate, symbolize? New life. New life. Life going forward. So the egg signifies the generation to come, life going forward that would benefit from the wisdom. We move forward. Life goes on. Progress and growth come from the past, and that is carried to the future. We in the present are the ones who are doing that carrying. So we, in effect, with this analogy, are this bird. Now, I already did that. So that was supposed to come here and uh, put it in the wrong place. So we already did that. OK, <clears throat> now we're going to get into part two here. I did want to uh, say a little bit more about the bird before we do that. I mentioned that uh, quite often it's a flying bird, but the one that has really become accepted as a symbol is the one like we've been looking at here, the standing bird, which is also like it is represented here on my bracelet. And if Tony were here, he'd be telling me 
I didn't take time to fluff it up and make it really shiny. Mm -hmm. But uh, that bird is standing. She's got, she's got her neck stretched back. She's getting the egg there. Tony makes these. Our friend is from Ghana. And he makes these from old Ghanaian coins. And then he molds them into various bracelets like this. He also has a lot of other things, that, crafts and things that he imports from, from Africa. And uh, so that's what's going on with that. All right. Now I get to uh, read you a little story today. A little girl from everywhere. A little girl from everywhere. What I'm sharing with you, and if there are um, editors here who would like to give me some critique, I would welcome it. But this is a rough, uh, the first book that I have planned in a series that I'm calling the Kansas Kids uh, Kansas Kids History Series. This is book one, The Little Girl from Everywhere. And uh, this story is dedicated to the memory of my paternal grandmother, Fern Grace Fletchall. She lived from 1918 to 1997. And it is based on the story of her ancestors as told to her in a conversation that I have imagined her having, her and her grandmother, little girl from everywhere. We will also later have the prologue that I will plan to have appear in all of the books uh, coming up, but we're going to talk about this little girl. That's her. That's my late grandmother and my grandfather. They were both Melungeons. Anybody know what that word is? Heard that? Okay, it's actually a word that also comes from Africa. It comes, it's the word Malungo, and it uh, meant shipmate, basically. And the first 20 Angolans who were brought to Virginia in 1619, this is how they referred to each other. And it became the, the word that became Malungeon. And both of these people and myself and these people here that are connected to me, we are Malungeons. All right. So, again, this story, I'm going to read you the preface and then I'll read you the, the actual book here. This is a story of historical fiction. Therefore, I take certain liberties in its telling. I add, for instance, the word little to my grandmother's name. I have given a name to her twin sister also, the one who died at birth and who was never given a name as far as I have ever heard. Uh, she wasn't even really spoken of, uh, that little baby uh, in my grandmother's family. But uh, in this story, I give that girl the name Bright Dawn. These names are relative to the Native American heritage that is part of my family's history. The other names are the true names of the people in my grandmother's paternal line. All right. Chapter one. Up into the sky. Up into the sky and down into Grandpa's arms. Up into the sky, and down into Grandpa's arms. Again, again, said Little Fern, giggling with delight. Higher and higher she would go, black curls bouncing and blowing and sparkling in the sun, Grandpa Jacob's strong arms sending her up and catching her as she came down, until they were both exhausted and laughing so hard they could barely breathe. Then falling down, they would roll over onto their backs as the pasture released the warm, earthy smell of henbit and clover and many different grasses and plants that lay beneath them. After they had lain there a bit, catching their breath and looking up into the sky, Jacob would say, Little Fern, I used to play the up in, into the sky game with your mother when she was little too. And you know, you look just like she did. She loved the game just like you do, he would say. Why, it's like having her right here with us. Chapter two, remembering Miranda. They were still and quiet for a while, just thinking silently. Then little friend said, I wish I could have known her. I'm very sorry that she died when I was born. Yes, little friend, I know. 
Uncle Jacob said. I'm just so glad that your mother and your father could grow up together and get married and have you because I love my son, who is your father, and I love Miranda, who is like a daughter to me too and became my son's wife. And you are not to be blamed for your mother's death. It's just the way of things, so they find. Your sister was born first, you know, and she also died. Yes, I know, little Fern said sadly. Mother called her Bright Dawn because it was early in the morning when she was born, and they are buried together in the cemetery over the hill. Yes, they are, Jacob would say, reaching and grasping, reaching for and grasping little Fern's hand, a tear making its way out of the corner of his eye. She did know you, though, Jacob then would say, and you knew her. When you came out from your mother's body, they placed you up onto her chest. Her eyes were wide open, and the two of you looked into each other's eyes for a long time. Then your mother, dear sweet Miranda, just before she died, started to smile, and she said, just look at all of that beautiful hair and little coils all over her head. It looks like little ferns when they come up from the earth in the spring. That's what your name shall be, my little girl from everywhere. You shall be called Little Fern. Chapter three, the little girl from everywhere. But why did she say that, Grandpa? Little Fern asked. You mean about the ferns? Jacob replied. No, I know about that part. Father has shown me the ferns in the woods when they first come up out of the earth in the springtime. They look like the head of a fiddle, like the one Uncle plays. No, I mean, why did she say, my little girl from everywhere? I'm here in Goff, Kansas. How can you be from somewhere and from everywhere? Well, Jacob said, with his blue eyes sparkling beneath his locks of shiny silver hair perched atop his high brown cheekbones, it's about the stories of your people and all the places that they come from. They came from everywhere. And if they had not come from all of those places, you would not be here in this place. Please tell me again about the places and the people, especially about the people. All right, all right. I will tell you again, Jacob said, pretending impatience. But you must promise me that if you ever have a grandson or a granddaughter, you will tell them the things I now tell you. Oh, I will, grandfather, little friend said. Chapter four. A place called Angola and the saying of the greats. They came from Africa, a place called Angola. They were brought here along with some other Angolans against their will. What is against their will? Mean, Grandpa, little Fern asked. And then, like the many times before, Jacob would tell about how these Angolans were captured by a fierce tribe known as the Imbangala, who had been hired by the Portuguese colonists to destroy the great Bantu kingdom of which the Angolans were citizens, and how they were sold by the Portuguese to the Spaniards, how they were then taken from their African home on a Spanish slave ship, which was overtaken by two English ships off the coast of New Spain which we now call Mexico. And then how it was they came to live in an English colony in America. These Angolans were brought to the English colony called Virginia in the year 1619. Two of them were your 10th great grandparents. One was named John and the other was named Margaret. Please say that grandpa, little friend would ask. Say what granddaughter? All of the greats, please say all of the greats. So Jacob would smile and say, all right, all right. Let's say the greats. And again, pretending the burden, but really so happy she asked, okay, it's like this. Your father is Lorenzo. Lorenzo is my son. That makes me your grandfather. My wife, Margaret, is your grandmother. We together are two of your grandparents the mother and father of your father, Lorenzo. So Lorenzo has a mother and a father. His mother and father also had the mother and the father. And each time we go back, we use the word great to keep track of the count. So John and Margaret Gowan were your 
So we began revving up for the rapid setting of the grades. Great, 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 great grandparents. Saying this as fast as you could as both of them burst out into uncontrollable laughter. Chapter five, heritage. <clears throat> After he had caught his breath, Jacob continued. Now, John and Margaret were just small children when they were brought to Virginia. But wait, Grandpa, little Fern interrupted. My grandmother is named Margaret, and my 10th great-grandmother was also named Margaret. This fact was just dawning on little Fern's mind for the first time. Yes, and later when your 10th greats, John and Margaret grew up, they got married, and they had a son named Mahill. And when Mahill grew up, he also got married. We don't know the name of the woman who married, but we think she came from somewhere in Europe. And so now do you begin to understand the everywhere, little Fern? Yes, Grandpa. John and Margaret came from Angola, the place on the continent of Africa. Did I say the right word, Grandpa? Continent? Yes, little Fern, you did. Okay, good. And then John and Margaret's son, the Hill, was born in Virginia. That is part of the continent called America. Happy to be working with the word continent in again. So he was an American like the United States of America. Well, yes, said Jacob, but at that time, Virginia was an English colony in America. There were no United States just yet. That came about long after many years and many battles and a great big war. We will talk about that some more another time. But now, tell me what else you remember, little Fern. What else about our ancestors? Okay, but Grandpa, you said England. Where is that? The little fern that is way across the Atlantic Ocean on the continent of Europe. He winked, pleased that he could also work in Fern's new favorite word. So is England where Mahill's wife was from, Grandpa? You said she was from Europe. Very possibly, little fern. She might have been from Ireland or Scotland or Germany. There were many people from many places coming into Virginia at that time. And there were people who were already here before any of the Europeans ever came here and before the Africans were brought here. So he could have married one of those women. You mean like our people, the Cherokee, Grandpa? Yes, like that, little friend. And we know that Mahill's son, Thomas, married a Cherokee. Her name was Winona. She was given the English name Winona Ann. She was actually from the Pamunkey tribe, one of the tribes that were led by the great chief Powhatan, but she became a member of the Cherokee tribe. Little Fern, who had been quietly saying the name Winuna as she listened to Jacob. Then she asked, wasn't there someone who had the word Cherokee as part of his name, Grandpa? Yes, said Jacob. He was the son of Thomas, Gowan, and Winuna. He was named William, and he went by the name of William Cherokee Gowans. Yes, that's the one, said Little Fern. You have spoken of him before. Is that why we are Cherokees? Well, that's why that's where it starts for us. Yes, Little Fern. And like you, William was from everywhere too. Really? asked Little Fern, her eyes wide and sparkling. Of course, said Jacob. Her ancestors were uh, his ancestors were from Africa and Europe. His mother was a Native American, and the woman he married was named Catherine Patterson. Her grandparents were from Scotland. That's an island nation off the coast of England. So all of these people from everywhere were getting together in Virginia and getting married and having families together. Our family, other families just like ours, they all started in Virginia. They worked together and they built communities together and they had to get through a lot of very difficult things. They had to hide sometimes. They had to fight in wars. They even had to keep the knowledge of where all of their people came from in their family secret. Coming up with clever ways to keep these stories passed down and preserved in the family so that they and the stories would be safe. Are you telling me secret stories right now, Grandpa? Yes, I am, Granddaughter. These are the stories of your heritage. My heritage? Grandpa, what is that? Your heritage, little fern, is about where all of your people came from and where and how they live. I've told some of these stories before, and as long as I can, I will keep telling them so that you will know your heritage. Can you please finish this heritage story, Grandpa? 
You probably wanted him to do that too. So <laughs> I'm almost done with that. <clears throat> I'm sorry I keep interrupting, but I have a lot of questions. You keep right on asking those questions, little firm. You can't learn the answers unless you ask the questions. But it is getting close to dinner time. So we're going to come down off this hill pretty soon and go find out what your grandmother has been cooking for us to eat today. So we might have to continue this little lesson later. Then looking down the hill toward the cabin, Jacob said, yes, dinner must surely be ready by now. Shall we go and see what's on the menu? Yes, let's, said the little fern, thinking of what a good cook her grandma was and anticipating a wonderful meal at her grandparents' table. And so they got up together, leaving outlined evidence of their presence matted down upon the flowers and grasses where they had lain on their backs. As they got up, little Fern gave her grandpa a big hug and said, thank you for telling me our family's story, grandpa. You're welcome, little Fern. And they held hands as they walked down the hill toward the cabin, eager to find their lunch and looking forward to more conversations to come about their family's history. <clears throat> And real quickly, I'll just put these names uh, up on the screen and they are available for you to research. Uh, John is what he came to be known as, John Gowen. And the way they spelled it was the G-O-W-E-N in the colony. And there are a lot of variations to that spelling that came down through history. But there are indications because it was a Portuguese colony, Angola. Angola had colonized um, I mean, Portugal had colonized Angola for like 200 years before Virginia was a colony. And so there's indication that his name was João João Dago Gawin or something to that effect. And it became John Gowen. So he was born in 1616 in Angola. We're not sure on the date of his death. There are indications that he lived as long as 100 years. He's on record as being a magistrate in the colony. He was indentured, he served his indenture, became a contributing member of the colony. But of course, kind of upon the heels of his death, uh, there, was, there were laws passed that said that a black man would never adjudicate on the case of a white man again because the color laws were coming in to the thing. They weren't there to start, but they soon were. But he's my 11th great grandfather. His son with Margaret was Nahil, which became Michael. <clears throat> and Michael's son was Thomas. And Thomas is the one who married uh, the Cherokee woman. And then their son, the one that I descend from, uh, because they, these people had large families and a lot of goats, cousins everywhere. Maybe some of you. <laughs> Uh, but he identified as William Cherokee. Sometimes I think they probably just called him Cherokee. Uh, his son then was John Frederick Gowen. And then John's son was William Shadrach Gowen. Shadrach was a name that was used a lot in the family. And uh, before there was photo identification, like a driver's license, like we have today, free people of color had to travel with their papers. And so it was real convenient if your uncle was named Shadrach and you were also named Shadrach and your first cousin was also named Shadrach. And so you could borrow each other's papers like that and do, get around. And they did that. Shadrach, Meshach they were names in a bed. And it's probably the source I, I gather that that's the sort of my grandmother said this and my father said this as little kids when it's time for bed. Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to go from William to me. Daniel Goins was William's, uh, well, Shadrach William. Uh, he was the son of that one. And then this is where my Goins line daughter's out. Because Edith was Daniel's daughter. And then Edith marries a man named Harmon Byerly. And then their daughter is Rebecca Byerly. And then Rebecca marries a man also named Harmon, but Harmon Grandstaff. And then their daughter is Margaret Grandstaff. She's the Margaret in the story that I was just sharing with you. That's who she is based on. Their son is Lorenzo Seymour Fletcher. And his 
daughter, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, Fern Grace Fletcher, buried right up in Sabetha in the cemetery. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll have some more information about that. Tennyson Lee Wright is my father, daughter of Fern Grace Fletcher. Fern's mother's name, the Miranda, she was also a Wright. And I'm just now tracking down how my grandparents were distant cousins, the two that I showed you up on the screen. They were the distant Wright cousins. <clears throat> And so, come to me. I am Métis and Melungeon on my father's side. I am Métis, and actually I found a Goings on my mother's side. So she might qualify for Melungeon as well. <laughs> this is me. You can figure out how old I am. And you can know that the dash means that's why I'm standing here because I'm <laughs> still here. I was born in Compton, California. My parents grew up in Colorado Springs, and uh, dad went into the Navy and stationed in Long Beach. They had a little apartment in Compton, so that's why I can say that. I was born in the Los Angeles County Hospital in Compton, California. And that's me. I'm the 11th great grandson of John Gowen and Margaret Cornish, two of the original Angolans who were brought to the Virginia colony in 1619. <clears throat> you know what that means. <laughs> All right, this time, let's see. Do our neck two or three times and then kind of snake your arms. Think about the bird when he's flying and say, Sankofa. Sankofa. Right. And now you can have a seat again. Thank you. We'll move into part three finding the story of your people. Uh, I had in mind that three objectives to get here in this time. Um, and I thought I would have, um, any of you know Sherry Camp? She's, she descends from Margaret and uh, she and I are distant cousins because of that. I thought she was gonna give me like a, a list, but I'm sure your packets have some resources lists in them. There were upstairs, just across the hall is the Topeka room where all the genealogy stuff is. So uh, in terms of resources, there's plenty of, of those. Uh, I'll give you some titles real quickly to some books if you want to look at them, which would be specific for the 1619 thing, the, the 20 and odd. Uh, another cousin, K.I. Knight, has written a historical fiction for children series called Fate and Freedom. And what she does is she puts flesh on our ancestors, makes them real, Very does a very nice job with that. But it is historical fiction, but 90% historical, very little fiction, just kind of giving a face to the name. And then she has also written a book called Unveiled, The 20 and Odd, documenting the first Africans in England's America, 1619, to 1627, uh, 25, excuse me, and beyond. That's K.I. Knight. I'll circulate this around so you can look at those titles too. Another one which I don't have, but he's another cousin. I've been on some panels with this Goins cousin, Rick Murphy. Um, he's written several books. We have uh, Freedom Road is in this library. He's written that one. And we may have one or two more by now of his, but this is one of his newer, newer ones. It's called Arrival of the First Africans in Virginia by R.I.C. Rick Murphy. And if you need to see those titles, we can circulate this around or whatever we need to do there. So I wanted to kind of mention, mention that about resources. And there's a lot of, I'm sure there's resources sitting right around this table. I'm quite certain of that. 
Well, be sure that's what these conferences are about to kind of help you connect with those things. All right. And then we're going to read another piece that I talk about Grandpa Jacob or Finding Jacob Fletchall. And then finally, we'll conclude with I'll, I'll read the prologue that I plan to have in, in my books. Resources. And there is Jacob. He, he's the one seated. His, his uh, son, Lorenzo, is the one standing behind him. I cropped this from a family picture. <clears throat> I believe this picture was taken when Margaret died, the, fun the funeral for Margaret. And Jacob and most of his children are in the picture, but I scaled it down so you can see Jacob and uh, Lorenzo there. This is Jacob Allen Fletchell. He, he is a direct descendant of the Angolan, John Golan, who was brought to the Virginia colony in 1619. Jacob Fletchall is my great, great grandfather. And there standing behind him is Lorenzo Seymour Fletchall, my great grandfather, and the father of the little fern that appears in the story. <clears throat> so I'm going to read this piece, and this will pretty much take us to the, the conclusion here. In an article appearing in the publication Scientific American called Genetic Memory, How We Know Things We Never Learned, Daryl Treffert writes, Leslie Lemke is a musical, musical virtuoso, <clears throat> even though he has never had a music lesson in his life. Like blind Tom Wiggins a century before him, his musical genius erupted so early and spontaneously as an infant that it could not possibly have been learned. It came factory installed. In both cases, professional musicians witnessed and confirmed that Lemke and Wiggins somehow, even in the absence of formal training, had innate access to what can be called the rules or vast syntax of music. He goes on to talk about one Alonzo Clemens, who suddenly manifested marvelous sculpting skill as an infant after suffering a head injury. So in the article, he talks about the prodigious savant as well as the acquired savants, with both varieties giving evidence to the theory of genetic memory. A sparrow, or a wood thrush, or a warbler, or, or a mockingbird, and other such oxine birds learn their songs by listening to the songs of other birds. But then there are the suboxine species, like flycatchers and others, who even when raised in soundproof isolation, still come up with the exact song of their progenitors. How do the migratory birds know the route to take? How do the monarch butterflies find their way each year? In animals, it is called instinct. With the human savant, it is termed by some to be a congenital aptitude for certain mental activity, which showed itself at so early a period as to exclude the notion that it could not, that it could have been required by the experience of the individual. Mr. Treffert says, I call that genetic memory, and I propose that it exists in all of us. I am inclined to agree with his conclusion and concur with his proposal. It's an idea that has always been with me. Even when I try to ignore it or fight it, it remains. I had a profound experience with it the other day while grasping a handful of dirt. A handful of dirt from the surface of the earth above the burial place of an ancestor, my great-great-grandfather, Jacob Allen Fletchall. In my family, Fletchall is the line of my paternal grandfather. Fletchall was originally Fletcher in Scotland. This is Jude Fletcher. <clears throat> they were part of the illustrious clan MacGregor, a Highland Scottish clan that claims origin in the early 800s. The clan's most famous member you may have heard of is Rob Roy McGregor, a supporter of the Jacobite cause of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. The clan is also uh, given the credit as being the first family in Scotland to, be, to begin playing the bagpipes in the 17th century. So the McGregors and their sects, like Fletcher, 
were persecuted by the British for some 400 years. And this probably had something to do with my ancestors coming to the American colonies and perhaps the modification of the spelling of their surname. I have traced the family line to one James Fletcher and his wife Agnes Renke Fletcher uh, in Scotland. And it was their son Thomas who came to reside in Maryland and with him came the change of the name to Fletcher. So if there's Fletchers, I'm very possibly related to them. If it's Fletchall, I know that I am, because this was the only line that did that with that name. <clears throat> it, I have always known that my grandmother's family came out of the Carolinas and moved to Kansas. Before that, the family had been in the American colonies, and before that, Nova Scotia. I know that this Fletchall line was an Acadian Métis line, a blended Scottish, French, Jewish, and indigenous. I also know that this Métis family married into the Melungeon family of John Bowen, one of the original 20 and odd Angolans, the first Africans who were brought to the Virginia colony. So the Fletchalls also became Melungeon. In fact, when my grandmother married my grandfather, he was also connected to the Melton Melungeon line and some other Melungeon lines. So both of my paternal grandparents were Melungeon. The Fletchalls came to identify themselves as Cherokees, something they spoke of privately within the family but absolutely never openly with the public. My grandmother told my father when he was a child, now you're an Indian, but don't go tell nobody you're an Indian because it will only mean trouble. At some point, the self-identity became Cherokee. And then at some point, that also was to be kept knowledge only within the family. This was the route things took in their line. This was how they perceived themselves. Sadly, along with this identity, my grandmother was warned by her forebears to never have anything to do with people of known African descent. She did not know that her colonial family had been strictly Angolan, Angolans who then began to marry Cherokees and Europeans. So there's a lot more to that story. Sabetha, Kansas is about one hour north of where I live in Topeka. This is where my grandmother's family made their home. They farmed, raised cattle, hogs, and sheep, and did very well for themselves. They were, in fact, among the founders of the city, which came to be known as Sabetha, Kansas. Consequently, in the Sabetha Cemetery, there are two <coughs> extensive sections where many of my relatives are buried. I had never been to the cemetery until 1997. And if you recall, that was the date of the year of my grandmother's death. I grew up in Western Oregon. My wife grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. She and I were married in 1984. Throughout our marriage, we have lived in several states and cities because of my work with the church. In October of 1996, we moved here to Topeka, Kansas. This stay in Topeka has been the longest stay in one location for us today. Nine years after our move to Kansas on July 7th, 1997, my grandfather, my grandmother, Fern Grace Fletch Albright, breathed her last breath upon this earth. I'm about to wrap up. I didn't even get a 10 minute warning, but I've been trying to watch the box. <laughs> we're we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Fern Grace Fletch Albright left her home and her family in Kansas when she was a mere girl of 13 years. My grandmother's mother died from complications of childbirth after giving birth to her and her stillborn twin sister. The father remarried when she was only six. My grandmother was the youngest of 12 children. Apparently, her stepmother made it pretty plain that she cared not in the least for little Fern and, in fact, made her home life a horrible existence. My grandmother spent her youth more like a foster child being passed among her other siblings and her grandparents. And I'm going to cut it short because we don't have time to read this other page. But basically what happened is my grandmother moved to Colorado and went to a seminary school, learned the trade of child care and house cleaning. And across the street from the school was a soda fountain where a young man named Tennyson Playwright worked as a soldier. And so that's how they got together. <clears throat> but the, the point of 
finding Jacob Fletcher always. I was at a conference like this. It was one that was being held over at the Kansas Historical uh, Society Museum, being hosted by the Topeka Genealogical Society. And uh, there was a session where we were to hand in questions if we had conundrums, brick walls, you know. And, and so I handed my question in. And that question, and you don't really know this, but I think maybe you were at that when you walked in. No? <laughs> anyway, I, there was a panel. We were in this room. Like we're here in this room, and uh, I handed in my question, and it just so happened that one of the ladies on the panel happened to be a flesh hall relative as well, and she said, as a matter of fact, the state has the records on your grandpa in the building right next door, and so that's when I began. I, I learned that, well, after his wife died, he became an alcoholic, and uh, probably had an alcohol and his kind of dementia thing going on. Plus, he was Native American descent, or you know, he was a legend, so all kinds of stories. Too. But they, they perceived him as a blue eyed Indian, and he was crazy. And he was in that state hospital, and that's where he died. And he's buried out there on those grounds. I got the coordinates from the state, I went out there on a windy Kansas day, I measured out to 295 feet, nine inches between the row markers and found the place where he's buried. And my relatives and I are going to try to get a, a marker there. There's a plaque, you know, a granite plaque that has the names of everyone buried there. It's just that they're not, you know, grave markers for each burial place. But when I was there holding that dirt, it was like I was holding his hand. And then when I let the dirt go, some of it blew away to the north. And so I think some of Jacob probably made its way to Sabetha by sundown that night. All right, we're we're gonna we're done now. We're exceeded our time here, but one more time, let's do our stretch. Our last variation on the stretch. <laughs> This time, I want you to turn to the person beside you on your right and then your left and give them a hug. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Much love and respect. Thank you for coming.